Welcome to the Pre-K through 4 Pennsylvania Educator Certification Test Module 1 Masterclass. In this lesson, you will learn the most important need-to-know topics to help you pass your Pre-K through 4 exam, including the foundations and principles of child development and learning, types of assessment to ensure children's continuous development and achievement of defined standards and goals, the strategies for meeting the needs of English language learners and students with disabilities in an inclusive pre-K through four setting, understanding family and community relationships and collaboration with families, colleagues, and other professionals too, as well as the understanding of legal, ethical, and professional roles and responsibilities of the pre-K through four teacher. Hey there, my name's Elliot Zelinskis. I'll be your test prep instructor for your pre-K through four exam. I'm a credentialed teacher, and now it's my job to help you pass this important exam. I know how challenging, scary, and stressful teacher certification exams are, so if you need to pass this exam, to launch your credentialed teaching career, make sure to sign up to Cracking the Pre-K Through Four, my free email course filled with test prep resources that make studying and passing your Pre-K Through Four exam simple. Start by heading to the top of your browser and typing www.teacherpreps.com forward slash pre-k dash four dash packed dash exam. Have a look at our test prep offerings to get access to our full test prep for this exam, which includes study guides, quizzes, full-length timed practice tests for every single module. And for the free resources, scroll all the way down to the bottom, click that blue button that says get study materials so I can send you some free resources right now. All right, let's jump straight into module one masterclass. All right, so module one includes a total of 36 selected response questions, which means there are no essays to start with this exam. Thought I'd start us off on a good note. All right, also, you'll receive 45 minutes to complete module one, which gives you a total of one minute and 15 seconds to complete each question. Then you will also have 15 minutes to complete a testing tutorial prior to beginning your exam. Furthermore, if you're registered to take all three modules during a single test session, you will also have a 15 minute break between each module. Now let's move on to module one's content areas, which are divided into two separate segments, including number one, child development, learning and assessment, which is worth 60% of your total module one exam score. And then we have collaboration and professionalism, which is worth 40% of the module one exam score. Now rest assured that this module one test prep masterclass follows the exact exam specifications to make sure you are totally ready for test day. So if you haven't already, go grab your pen and paper and let's jump in to lesson number one, principles of child development and learning. Now, if you haven't already, please make sure to hit that thumbs up button, share this video with that special bestie in your teacher preparation program, and smash that subscribe button if you want to be notified for my other pre-K through four module one videos. All right, starting with understanding influential educational theorists that we're going to need to know for our exam. First, we have Jean Piaget, who developed the theory of cognitive development which divides cognitive development into four stages, including sensory motor, pre-operational, concrete operational, formal operational, and we need to know the differences between these cognitive developmental stages. Let's jump into that. First, beginning with the sensory motor stage, which happens from birth to two years old, and this is when children experience the world through movement and senses. They learn object permanence. Now, object permanence is a notion that's important to your exam. So keep in mind that the object permanence 
happens and refers to the understanding in children that objects still exist even when they're not visible or audible. Now, this concept is illustrated in young infants who get distressed during games like peekaboo. For example, they react a certain way because they're not yet old enough to grasp the concept or the object that the object that they were just a second ago interacting with, it's out of sight. So in their case, it's out of mind. And this again is object permanence. We often receive a question on your pre-K through four exam about this exact terminology. The next stage we're gonna get into with cognitive development from Piaget is the pre-operational stage, which happens from two years old to seven years old. This is when children begin to think symbolically and learn to use words and pictures in order to represent objects. Now, children at this stage tend to be more egocentric and they really struggle with understanding other people's viewpoints. Now, moving on to the next stage is our concrete operational stage. This happens in children from the age of seven to 11. Now, <clears throat> at this stage, children begin to think logically about critical uh, concrete events. They understand the concept of conservation and can organize objects into leveled categories. Now, our fourth stage here is the formal operational stage, and this begins at the age of 12 and goes on up. Now, here, abstract thinking begins, such as teens when they start to understand hypothetical scenarios and they have the ability to use logical reasoning. Now, our next important educational theorist is Lev Vygotsky, who created the sociocultural theory. Now, key concepts from Vygotsky that we should be familiar with for our exam is that he emphasized the role of social interaction and culture in cognitive development. He also created the zone of proximal development, which is the difference between what a child can do independently and what they can do with guidance from a skilled partner, like a parent, a big brother, sibling, sister, cousin, teacher. Um, now, Vygotsky, <clears throat> excuse me, Vygotsky also came up with scaffolding, which as we know is a temporary support given to a child, which allows them <clears throat> to perform tasks that they wouldn't have been able to do alone. Now, our third person that we're gonna be talking about is Eric Erickson. And he created the stages of psychosocial development. So let's take a look at these stages now. First, there is trust versus mistrust, which happens from birth to 18 months. And this is when children develop a sense of trust when caregivers provide reliability, care, and affection and a lack of this trust leads to mistrust. Then we have uh, autonomy versus shame and doubt. And this happens to children about the age of two to three when children need to develop a sense of personal control over physical skills and they begin to build a sense of independence. And then finally we have initiative versus guilt, which happens from the ages of three to five when children begin to assert themselves more frequently in, by initiating the activities that they want to participate or play in, um, they have more of a sense of their own accomplishments as well. So moving on, let's talk about Howard Gartner and his interesting theory of multiple intelligences, which proposes that people do not actually have a single fixed intelligence, but a range of intelligences. And what he noted were linguistic, logical, musical, kinesthetic, spatial, interpersonal, and also intrapersonal, as well as naturalistic. Now, for our exam, we want to remember that this theory from Gardner suggests that educators should provide diverse learning environments that offer various ways for students to learn and express their understanding of what's being taught in the classroom. Now, on to a new yet related topic, let's now discuss the teaching theories that we should know for our test. So first we're gonna start with the constructivist theory, and this emphasizes learning as an active constructive process where learners build new knowledge based from their past experiences and what they've learned before. Next we have the behavioralist theory, which focuses on observable behaviors 
emphasizing that learning is a response to external stimuli where reinforcement and punishment shape behavior. So it really helps me to remember the behavioralist theory from the other theories that we have and we will talk about from the difference between praise and punishment. Now moving on to social cognitive theory, which highlights the importance of observing and modeling the behaviors, attitudes, and emotional reactions of others with self-efficacy, which as a quick refresher, is an individual's belief in their capacity to act in the ways necessary to reach specific goals that they might have for themselves. Next, and the last teaching theory that we'll discuss right now is the cognitive theory, which includes memory, problem solving, and decision making. This stresses the role of internal processes and prior knowledge. All right, now you might receive a question in module one about response to intervention or a multi-tiered system of support. So let's talk about the three tiers that we need to be familiar with for test day. Starting with tier one, this is the foundational level, which includes high quality evidence-based instruction, and support provided to all students in the general education classroom. The goal really is to meet the needs of most students at this level. You can think of tier one as the normal traditional classroom. Next, we have tier two, and this offers targeted interventions for students who are not yet made making or meeting adequate progress in the general education classroom. These conventions are more focused and intensive than tier one and are often conducted in small groups. And then third, we have tier three. And these are for our students who need even more support, more individualized, intense support. Interventions at this tier are highly specialized and they are typically designed to address specific learning deficits or behavioral issues. Now, for your exam, you will likely be asked to demonstrate your understanding of typical and atypical language abilities for students from pre-K through fourth grade, and that's a long, big range. So let's cover this now so you are totally ready for test day. Now, in pre-kindergarten, this is age three to four, students can typically understand and follow simple instructions. They can use simple three to four word sentences, and they can speak clearly enough to be understood by family members, by teachers, by people who they, they know. Um, they can also ask and answer simple questions. But pre-kindergartners typically struggle with using complex sentences or fully understanding time concepts like yesterday and tomorrow. Now let's go to kindergarten. This is age five to six. Typically, students at this age range can speak more complex sentences than in the pre-K level, and they can tell simple stories now. They also use basic grammar correctly, and they start to recognize some basic written words. Now, students at the kindergarten age will struggle with reading and writing more complex sentences, as well as understanding any abstract language that we might provide them with. Now, moving into first grade, remember this is age six to seven, students here can typically read and understand age appropriate books. They can write simple sentences with some grammatical errors. They can also use language to express their ideas, their wants and their needs. They can also follow multi-step directions now, um, but second grade, excuse me, first graders typically cannot yet fully grasp this, um, literacy concepts like metaphors, for example, and they also struggle to write detailed or structurally complex paragraphs. They're just not there yet. However, moving into second grade, remember this is age seven to eight, these students can typically read more confidently, particularly out loud. Uh, they can also start to write short paragraphs with uh, correct basic grammar and understand a use of wider vocabulary. Now, they can also understand instructions orally, so no longer need to always put pictures next to instructions, but we can tell them multi-step instructions orally and they can usually complete those simple tasks. Um, however, second graders are going to struggle with understanding nuanced figurative language as well as writing complex compositions. Now then in third grade, there's a jump that happens from eight to nine students typically 
really begin to have the ability to read more complex books and for longer periods of time. They can also use conjunctions to form compound sentences, write paragraphs that are clear with clear topic sentences, and even engage in conversations with more advanced vocabulary, including with their peers, with the teachers, um, with other people who might be outside of their classrooms as well. However, even third graders are going to struggle with understanding sarcasm and nuanced language, uh, as well as understanding deeper text. That's when third grade teachers might ask students to begin to read between the lines or this character in the story did this. Why do you think that happened? All right, moving into fourth grade, this is at the age of nine to 10. Students can typically read and comprehend chapter books. They can write multi-paragraph essays, understand a range of vocabulary, including some figurative language too, as well as discuss and argue um, based off logic reasoning. Um, they can pick parts out of the story in order to show a certain um, structure or give their reason to why they feel a certain character did what they did. And uh, yet they can typically not yet understand complex or abstract theoretical concepts right with the structural complexity of an adolescent for our instruction covering. Now, the influence of the classroom environment on learning, let's talk about this now. Let's recall that there are four aspects to be ready to demonstrate your understanding of for exam day. Now, first one is the physical environment, which is really important. And if you receive a question on your exam about the impact of the classroom, the physical environment has on students learning, remember that a well-structured physical environment enhances focus, reduces in distractions, and supports various learning activities for our students. It plays a vital role in children's cognitive and physical development, and also effective strategies in order to enhance the physical environment of our classrooms are to keep the classroom organized, as well as make sure it's safe. Um, desks, chairs, lamps, um, safety equipment, um, even school supplies, they are all appropriately in reach or out of reach for our students. Also, keep in mind that visual aids and labels help our children navigate um, the space, the learning space even better too. All right, next, we need to be aware of the emotional environment and the impact it has on the students' reading literacy. Um, so an environmentally supportive environment or classroom promotes the confidence and risk-taking in learning and a sense of security. Children learn better when they feel emotionally safe. So in order to accomplish this, we can establish routines that provide predictability and also create a positive and nurturing atmosphere by acknowledging children's emotions and fostering positive relationships. Now, next, going into the intellectual environment of the classroom, keep in mind that this stimulating environment of a classroom will help spark curiosity for our students, and it also encourages critical thinking and problem-solving skills. Now, a strategy or strategies to enhance the intellectual curiosity or uh, uh, spark for our students through this aspect is to provide diverse and challenging materials for the students. So help them get their hands on all different types of textures, materials, and different ways of expressing their learning, as well as engaging through inquiry-based learning and curiosity of open-ended questions and opportunities for explore exploration for the students. Now, keep in mind that an important part of the social environment component is a having an inclusive environment which will enhance the communication skills and cooperation as well as build empathy for our students. Now, having a socially safe environment will help children learn to work in groups and understand diverse perspectives. And in order to effectively set this up, we can facilitate group activities and collaborate, um, put our students in collaborative partnerships, pair groups, small groups, in order to complete projects and tasks. 
um, as well as we can teach and we can model uh, conflict resolution and social skills so they, they have a good model of what to base off of. Um, we can also encourage um, teamwork and pair work. And now, in order to pass your pre-K through four PECT exam, it's gonna be ex essential to understand how to build and maintain inclusive, respectful, supportive, motivating, and challenging learning environments for all children in the classroom. So let's break these down concept by concept, starting with building inclusive environments. So while you're watching this video, be on the lookout for the answers to the problems because those are the solutions that you'll want to pick out when you're solving your multiple choice problems. So here we have inclusive environment. And the key concept with inclusivity is that we make all children feel represented, valued, um, regardless of their backgrounds, their abilities, their learning styles. And this is a very important dynamic while teaching in the classroom and also a strong focus on the exam. So let's take a look at some key examples. First, we wanna make sure to incorporate diverse cultural materials by selecting books, games, and resources that represent a variety of cultures and languages. Now we want to include music, art, and stories from a range of cultures in our lesson plans that we create. And in order to do so, we will also want to ensure the accessibility for children with disabilities. By arranging the classroom to allow for easy movement for all children of all physical abilities. Um, Remember to use tactile learning. That can be one of the answers on a multiple choice problem that you might be looking for, as well as use visual supports. So think about the five senses when you're identifying the correct response on your exam. Another is to ensure that auditory materials are available for those students who might have hearing impairments, as well as considering the height of tables and also utilizing technology um, in an appropriate way so that people, um, young, our young learners, they can use a screen in order to get that speech to text software in order to aid their learning if that's what works best for them. All right, great. Now let's talk about our English language learners in the classroom where we want to utilize resources that support language development. Now this includes bilingual books, games, activities, and all of this in order to encourage conversation and vocabulary building. Remember, English is their second language, and we want to get them receiving the language so that they can produce the language. All right. Also, for our ELL English language learners, incorporate visual aids um, in order to help them. You know, if you say apple, have a picture or the realia of a real apple. Um, now, this is going to be an important topic on your pre-K through four. Let's keep going with understanding diversity among young children in the classroom. So let's remember that our test administrators want us to embrace diversity in the classroom. So be on the lookout for solutions to your multiple choice questions that highlight recognizing the various forms of diversity in the classroom. This might include cultural, linguistic, ability-based or socioeconomic, as well as diversity um, of backgrounds, and also understanding that each child's background will influence their learning experience and needs. All right, let's keep going. Furthermore, as educators, we need to adapt for different abilities, and this might mean catering to a range of strengths, weaknesses, abilities, so that all students can learn the standards by the end of the unit, semester, or year. So we need to use differentiated instruction um, so that our activities have tiered assignments. They're varied questions. Some might have different supports, scaffolds, um, word banks on the top, places to write on the bottom, use graphic organizers as well. And the good thing of that helps English language learners or um, learners of all types, uh, all of the visuals, the auditory, the tactile, the kinesthetic learning methods, it helps all students. So really be on the lookout for your exam. When you see a solution that includes these five senses or even just one of the five senses, you know, 
double down on that answer. Look at that one closer. All right. Now let's pause right here. You're doing awesome. If you're made it through this part of the video, thanks. And let's take a quick breather because now it's quiz time. And for those who are enrolled in the full test prep course, just click the red button labeled module one, quiz one under this video to check your current understanding of the learnings that we just went over in lesson number one. However, if you haven't yet signed up for the full test prep, but you did sign up for the free email course right at the beginning of the class, go ahead and click and check that email that I just sent you where you get access to quiz one so you can check your readiness for lesson one as well. Then once you've completed the quiz, come back, push play, and let's start lesson two. All right, welcome to lesson two of the pre-K through four exam covering module one. Now this lesson focuses about the various types of assessments that we'll be using in the classroom. So let's check it out in depth. Assessments play a pivotal role in education, serving as the key indicator or one of the key indicators for our students' learning and their progress. Our assessments need to be aligned with educational standards in order to ensure that teaching objectives directly correspond with the skills and the knowledge that our students are expected to acquire. And this alignment not only guides effective instruction, but also allows educators to make more informed decisions that cater to the diverse needs of all of our students in the classroom. So let's discuss the different types of assessments that you will be tested on for your exam. First, we have authentic assessments, and these require students to apply skills and knowledge to real world scenarios. Now, these are used to evaluate students' ability to apply learning in practical contexts, fostering higher order thinking skills. An example are project-based assignments or performance tasks. Then we have screening assessments, which are brief assessments conducted at the beginning of the school year or the learning period. That might be a module, that might be a chapter or a unit. And these are used to identify students at risk of educational difficulties, guiding early interventions. Now, an example includes early reading or math screening skills so that we know what students have already learned and what they still need to practice. Next, we have diagnostic assessments. You might be receiving a question on your exam that will ask you which assessment is used for in-depth understanding of specific strengths and weaknesses. And in that case, it would be to use a diagnostic assessment. Now, these diagnostic ass assessments are used to inform targeted instruction as well as intervention strategies for our students. An example includes a reading level assessment or a math skills diagnostic assessment. And next we have formative assessments, which are ongoing assessments. One of the most important keywords, this is an ongoing assessment that happens during the learning process. Now a teacher might be teaching and they might ask a comprehension checking question to gauge what students are comprehending from, for example, a story or a math lesson right in the middle of their lesson. Now, these are used to provide real-time feedback for the teacher about what the students are learning in order to shape and guide and direct the instruction. So if you just taught how to add double digits and only half of the students raise their hand to answer one of your questions, you might go back five minutes and reteach to show another example. And then again, that would be a formative assessment, right? <clears throat> now let's talk about quizzes and class discussions. Like these could be quizzes, class discussions, um, comprehensive checking questions. These are all examples of formative assessments. 
And finally, we have summative assessments, which are comprehensive evaluations that take place at the end of an instructional period. These are used to measure students' learning achievement against a set standard um, rate measurement. For example, in final exams or end of unit projects. And our final type of assessment that we'll look at is called the benchmark assessment. These are assessments administered periodically throughout the academic year in order to track students' progress against grade level standards and inform instructional adjustments. Now, examples include midterm tests and quarterly assessments as well. Now, for our assessment section, those were the types, but you'll also want to be familiar with the role in data-based decision making. Remember to take your exam with the approach for using data-driven instruction, which means that we educators, you and I, teachers in the classroom, we use assessment data to identify the learning gaps. That's the purpose of giving an assessment, is to check what students learned and what they still need practice with. We also use it to tailor instruction to meet the diverse needs of all of our students and that it helps us differentiate and modify instruction based off these student performances. Therefore, we use data-driven instruction to support student growth by employing assessment data for setting individualized learning goals. Now notice here that I'm really trying to use the assessment um, terminology that you might see on exam day, just so that you are totally ready to ace your pre-K through four exam. All right, in regards to assessments, supporting student growth, we also want to provide targeted feedback to all of the assessments that we provide, tell the students how well they're doing and what they can work on. We also use it to implement interventions based off specific areas that we got from feedback from the assessments that we gave. Now, in this next section, I'll guide you through the different informal and formal assessments teachers use in the classroom, where we'll discuss the characteristics, uses, advantages, and limitations of each. So for your exam, be on the lookout for questions that check your understanding for each of these assessments, requiring you to match the correct characteristic with its corresponding assessment. Starting with an overview that we've got informal assessments, and these include systematic observations, using portfolios, peer assessments, and group assessments. And then on the other side, we have our formal assessments, and these include curriculum-based assessments, criterion referenced tests, and norm reference tests too. So let's go over these beginning with systematic observations, which are unstructured, ongoing monitoring assessments. These are used to gather immediate quantitative data on student behavior and learning. Now, systematic observations in the classroom are great for teachers because they offer flexible, real-time insights. However, they're also subjective and oftentimes lack standardization. Next, we have student portfolios, which are a collection of student work over time, which are used to showcase student progress and achievements. And the advantage here is that they offer a more holistic view of student learning, but the limitation being that they are time consuming and may not represent day-to-day -day performance. Our next assessment that we'll take a look at are the peer assessments, which is used when students evaluate each other's work in order to develop critical thinking and self-reflection skills. So again, I'm using the terminology that you might see on, on test day, and it's easy to watch this video and to just kind of like mindlessly be watching, but use the terminology and reverse engineer this. So if peer assessments are used to evaluate each other's work in order to develop critical thinking, on test day, you might receive a question that's a scenario-based question like, Billy and Jane are peer partners working towards some project. The teacher uses an assessment in order to um, 
check the student's critical thinking and self-reflection skills, which assessment is most appropriate for this use. And you might get the list that I showed you a few slides ago, and it's gonna be your job to say, this is a peer assessment case, all right? So just one more time, this active learning approach is gonna be excellent for your test. Let's keep it going. Now, peer assessments, the great thing about them is that they encourage students um, response and they, they engage them in responsibility. Students also really like working with their peers and it helps them kind of check what others are doing. So if two students wrote a paragraph and one student really put time and effort into that paragraph and the other student didn't, that, that student will know like, oh, other students in my class at my grade in, at my age level are writing like this. It can be a really good way to indicate what other students are doing. Now, potential here is that um, there's a potential for bias as well as dependent on student understanding. So as the teacher, you can mark the, for example, paragraph um, effectively, but the student, if they just learned the task that you taught them, for example, where to put in commas, they might miss where a comma should have been placed. So just keep that in mind. Now, next we have group assessments, which are used during the evaluation of group tasks and dynamics in order to assess teamwork and collaborative skills. Now, this is great for promoting collaborative learning, but it can also obscure the individual contribution of the student, the individual student for the assessing teacher. We all know that whether you, you know, as a teacher or as a student, we can look back and think, you know, you were in a group one time and which student were you? Were you the, 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 the natural born leader? Were you the person who took the notes? Were you the person who, you know, ran the papers around? Or maybe you were the person who kind of slacked off and took the advantage of the other people, right? And so the group assessments aren't great for individual um, understanding of what the individual can do, but they are really good for how people work as a team. And we can use our observational skills in order to check that. All right, great. Next, there are three types of formal assessments that you'll want to be have that you'll want to know and have a firm grasp on for exam day. So let's go over these beginning with curriculum based assessments, which are tied to a specific curriculum and set of goals. And these are used to determine how well students are learning specific curriculum content. They're great for being directly aligned with instructional content, but they are limited in scope and um, are focused on a specific curriculum and specific areas, which again is a double-edged sword. That might be what we're looking for and it might not be depending on what you're truly assessing for. All right, next up we have criterion reference tests, and these measure students' performance against specific learning standards, and these are used to ascertain or to ensure that students have mastered particular skills or concepts. Now, these criterion reference tests have the advantage that they have clear objective criteria, but these tests do not compare student performance to others. And the third formal type of test that we'll need to know for our exam is the norm referenced test, which compares a student performance against a norm group in order to rank students' performance in relation to other peers. Now, these tests allow for a broad comparison across populations, but are less useful for understanding individual, <clears throat> excuse me, mastery of content. In this next section, we will explore the essential principles and practices involved in the assessment of students with disabilities and English language learners, focusing on legal, um, legally acceptable modifications and accommodations, as well as strategies aligned with Pennsylvania's language proficiency standards for English language learners, beginning with the assessment of students with disabilities. Now here, the legal framework to understand is that we want to have a good understanding of the overview, understanding of the Disabilities Education Act and also Section 504. 
of the Rehabilitation Act, which mandates that children with disabilities are entitled to a free, appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment, which includes individualized education plans or IEPs um, tailored to each individual student's unique needs. Now, next up, let's get ready for modifications and accommodations, which is a very important topic for your test. It's also an easy one to confuse, so let's get it down now. <clears throat> what we need to know is that, <clears throat> excuse me, modifications are changes in what's being taught or expected from the student, whereas <clears throat> Accommodations are changes in how a student learns or demonstrates learning without altering the test's content, such as extending time or giving a different test format, but still checking the same understanding. Next, let's go on to IEPs, another important topic for your exam. Remember, this stands for Individualized Education Programs, which tailor assessment strategies based on each individual student's IEP, which outlines specific accommodations and modifications necessary for assessments for that particular student. General principles for assessment to keep in mind when completing your exam are to ensure fairness and avoid discrimination and use multiple assessment methods to get a comprehensive understanding of the student's abilities and needs. Now let's move to assessment of English language learners by beginning with familiarizing ourselves with Pennsylvania's language proficiency standards for English language learners, which are standards to guide the development of language proficiency and academic achievement for English language learners. That was a mouthful, but again, it's the terminology that you might see on test day. So let me repeat that. If you receive a question on the exam about what is the purpose of Pennsylvania's language proficiency standards for English language learners, you will know that these standards help guide educators or teachers to understand the development of language proficiency and academic achievement for English language learners. Now, designing assessments for our English language learners, we need to remember to always align the assessments with the ELPS in order to ensure they are appropriate for the student's language development um, and their current stage of where they're at in their English journey, their English learning journey. All right, so we want to consider the linguistic and cultural backgrounds when we give assessment and um, our designs need to be catered to their understanding, their learning, their needs as well. Now, did I mention that you're doing an amazing job? If you're sticking with me, I appreciate that. I hope you find this video super helpful. We're going to get you to pass your pre-K through four exam, that's for sure. I know preparing for your teacher certification exams is rough. I've been through it myself. Um, and that's why I made these resources to help make passing simple. So now for the people who are fully enrolled in the pre-K through uh, four test prep program, thank you. Smart move. You're going to save so much time. Uh, and for you, it's quiz time. So take the second quiz, pause this video to check your understanding of lesson number two, and come back to play lesson three once you've completed the quiz. For those of you who haven't yet signed up to the full test prep, what are you waiting for? Honestly, this is such a good program. Just navigate to the top of your browser, type www.teacherpreps.com forward slash pre-k-4 dash pect dash exam and click on the blue enroll now button to get instant access to our comprehensive study guide six full-length practice tests, and quizzes for every single topic in the exam that you need to know. That's also being covered right here in this masterclass. So pause the video, enroll now, and come back for lesson three learnings. Here we are, welcome to lesson three. I'm super excited to have you, and I'm really pumped to be sharing this knowledge, these skills, to help you pass. Again, I've been through teacher certification exams and they are challenging, they're tough, right? And 
I hope this masterclass helps you nail the exam on your first try if you're going for the first time or if you've already passed and you failed and you've waited and now it's time for you to take it again. Ace this exam on your next try. This is lesson three of the pre-K through four PECT exam where I'm gonna teach you everything that you need to know in order to meet the diverse needs of English language learners. We're gonna go diving deeper into that topic in an inclusive setting within the pre-K through four class range. Without further ado, here we go, lesson three. For your pre-K through four exam, <clears throat> you will be required to demonstrate your understanding, your knowledge of language systems and structures, starting with the differences between academic and social language. Academic language is formal. Remember, it's specific to disciplines that might be social studies or science. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we have these in different educational settings. So the terminology, the vocabulary that we teach students in science is sometimes used in social studies, but sometimes not. So this is academic language. It also includes specialized vocabulary and complex sentence structures where you might see in a specific context or specific class. On the other hand, we have social language, and this is informal. It's used in everyday communication, and it relies on shared experiences for understanding. Next, let's discuss the three most common types of learning disabilities that you might be presented with on test day. First, we have dyslexia, which is having a typically slow progression in reading skills. Dyslexic students oftentimes show difficulty in phonemic awareness, word decoding, reading fluency, and comprehension. One more time, the um, information that I'm providing you with, you are going to want to reverse engineer that. So again, if you receive a question on test day that asks you, there is a student in the classroom who's showing difficulty in phonemic awareness or word decoding and or reading fluency or comprehension, you're gonna know that you should choose dyslexia as opposed to our next learning disability, which is dyscalculia. This is a hard one to pronounce. Let me try that again. I think I got the first right, but dyscalculia. There you go. All right, now this is when students struggle with number sense, all right, um, with memorizing arithmetic facts, organizing numbers, and understanding general mathematical concepts. And then we also have dysgraphia, where students show difficulty with handwriting, spelling, organizing ideas um, on their paper. And one more time, you can, you can be confident that you're going to receive at least one question checking your understanding of these learning disabilities. So again, reverse engineer the information that I'm providing you with. So when you are on test day and you read a question, you can pick out, you can identify the correct learning disability like that and move on to finish your test in time. All right, moving on to a new, again, yet related topic is universal design. And principles of universal design are gonna be a focus on the test because these make learning accessible for all students in the classroom. Now in this section, I'll teach you the appropriate ways to implement um, accommodations and modifications that are gonna be tailored for the students with IEPs. So. For your pre-K through four exam, you should understand assistive technologies such as speech to text software, audiobooks, and socialized keyboards. These all help and aid students with different learning abilities. And they're honestly a great um, addition if your classroom can uh, have iPads or other uh, you know, tablets or other technology to use. Oftentimes, this is going to be a great resource for our students who have trouble with uh, linguistic or textual analysis. Now, material adaptations, let's talk about it. This happens when you and I, us teachers, we modify the textbook or a worksheet or other educational materials in order to prov provide accessibility for all students. This might be enlarging the print. It might be providing Braille. 
It might be simplifying the language so that the students still learn the same context, the same skills, but they can do it at their level. Next, we have environmental arrangements, and we talked briefly about this last lesson, but remember that structuring the classroom in a specific way will help enhance accessibility, such as arranging desks for wheelchair access or creating quiet zones for students who need that extra concentration. Next, we have visual supports, and again, incorporating graphics, visual schedules, organizers. These all help in aiding students of all kinds. And it's exactly what I'm doing with these slides right now is that I remember signing up, I remember registering, I remember preparing for my teacher certification and the traditional uh, textbooks that are just printed in black and white, they don't include any visuals or any color, there's no graphs um, or captions or, or visual supports of any kind. It was really hard for me to learn uh, with the traditional study guides, and that's why I'm making this for you. This should be excellent for any of the visual auditory learners who need to pass this teacher certification exam, but we can think of ourselves as learners and then implement what works for us in our classroom to meet the needs of all of our students too. All right, so next, let's talk about the roles and responsibilities that general educators have as a collaborative member of a school, a community, and specifically, for our students with IEPs, um, we're gonna be teaming up with specialists, with parents, and with administrators. So let's talk about this now. Now, this is gonna be called collaborative planning, and this is working alongside the people in the building of our school. This might be um, therapists, parents, teachers, administrators, counselors, in order to support and develop uh, the needs to cater to that student with an IEP. Next, we have regarding um, implementing the IEP goals, understand and apply the specific goals and accommodations that are outlined in each student's individual IEP. Now, again, every student in your class probably will not have an IEP, but every student in your class that does have an IEP, that IEP, which is a document, is specific to that student. And the students with IEPs um, we always want to be monitoring their progress, whereby we regularly track and report on that student's progress toward their goals. So every IEP has goals, and we want to assist and support our students in uh, obtaining and reaching those goals on their specific IEP. Next, consider uh, promoting inclusive learning using cultural responsiveness. Again, another key word or phrase that you might see on test day. Now, this is when we incorporate diverse perspectives and materials in the curriculum to reflect the cultural backgrounds of all of our students. Remember, learning happens best when we build upon what we've already been taught, what we already know, what we've already experienced. So if you get students from different countries, put the flag of that country in or, or add parts of language just on the bulletin boards. If you have students from all walks of life, different places, um, different abilities, sh show that the students, um, they should be proud of their backgrounds. It will increase and improve and accelerate their learning. Now, also differentiation and accessibility, more key terms that you will see on your exam we use these to meet the varying needs of all of our students in the classroom. This ensures learning is accessible to everyone, including students with disabilities. For our next topic for your exam, you're gonna be asked to apply your knowledge of effective research-based instructional practices and strategies for students with disabilities in an inclusive classroom. So what we wanna do is we wanna use modeling this is where a teacher um, demonstrates a skill or a process, providing a clear example for students to emulate. And collaborative learning, where, uh, which is an instructional method where students work together in small groups to complete a task or achieve a common goal, fostering peer collaboration and teamwork. Students will learn a lot from the teacher but they also learn so much from their peers too. So putting them together can help fill in the gaps of the lessons 
skills, topics, understandings that they haven't yet acquired. Next, we have scaffolding. Again, this is a teaching strategy we've talked about in the past. We're going to continue talking about because it's an important key word. And this involves providing support and guidance to students when learning new concepts as we gradually remove the support as students become more proficient. Next, we have inquiry learning, and this is an approach where students are encouraged to explore, ask questions, and conduct investigations to develop a deeper understanding of the subject material that's being taught in the classroom for that lesson. Fantastic job. Thank you so much for sticking around. I know this video is going to be helpful for you. I hope you find it video. Uh, valuable. If you haven't already, hit the thumbs up button. I love that feedback. And now it is time to complete quiz number three. Check your understanding of this lesson for module one. Pause the video here and come back to push um, the play button for lesson four after finishing the quiz. Now, for those who have not enrolled into the full pre-K through four test prep, this is where I stress the importance of how much time and energy you will be saving when you enroll into the full test prep. Give yourself everything that you need to pass in one convenient place. Again, remember, our test prep includes study guides that are written in a non-fluff, bullet point style so that you can read and learn quickly. It also includes these video master classes that include quizzes for every topic that you need to know for test day and full length time to practice tests that you can take as many times as you want to double check your readiness for your exam day. So don't delay, get access to this prep right now so you can feel 100% confident that you will ace this on the next try. Now, your future students depend on you passing this exam, but your career as a certified teacher does too. You don't want to wait, prepare too late, not get test prep, end up failing, have to retake the exam, pay more money to do so, delay your teaching career. Just grab the test prep, study, pass it in a simple way, and I guarantee you, you will not regret it. All right, thank you so much for watching. This is where this video ends for you and continues for the students fully enrolled into our test prep program. I appreciate you watching and I hope to see you in module two. Bye-bye.